take your seats. We'll get kicking off very shortly. Excited. Can you, huh? Yeah, yeah, anyway. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's absolutely wonderful to welcome you to this London Global Cancer Week Special Symposium on building research capacity for affordable and equitable global cancer systems. Um, basically hosted by Institute of Cancer Policy at KCL, our friends at Ellipsis and eCancer. And of course it's to celebrate the absolutely remarkable life of Gordon McPhee, who we miss very, very dearly. And it's wonderful to have Claudia McPhee here this evening and Danny as well. So welcome. Um, there are a lot of friends as well. And for those of you online as well, if you don't know about Gordon's life, he was a most remarkable individual. And he had so many facets. He had so many passions and skills. And one of the things and one of the passions he had was global cancer. And certainly for many of us in this room, he was the really driving force back in the late 1990s and 2000s for global cancer. People often think of Gordon as being drug development and high income. Well, he absolutely believed passionately in global cancer and what it stood for. And you're going to hear a little bit from Claudia and, and friends of Gordon and Danny a little bit later on. Um, I'm also very in grateful indeed to my friend and the curator of the Gordon Museum, Professor Bill Edwards, for allowing us to host this meeting and the reception tonight in what is essentially one of the most remarkable gems. Um, certainly, guys, I would argue almost in the world, um, you're in the Gordon Museum. I'm going to say nothing more about it because delightfully Bill's agreed to say a few words about the history of the Gordon Museum and just to talk us through a little bit about that. So thank you so much, Bill. Um, the programme tonight is unashamedly eclectic um, with a glint of wildness, a bit like Gordon, actually. Um, we have a stellar cast of characters uh, talking to us on cancer tonight, on global cancer. We've got obviously these two main sessions, and I'll talk, run through in a second, the uh, running order. Um, we've got two major sessions talking about delivering and developing clinical trials for affordable technologies to build capacity. Um, we're also going to then talk a little bit about health systems research to build national cancer control plans, and I'm just hugely grateful for Andre and KT from IEA and WHO, and many colleagues from these organizations for flying in and joining us in person. They're incredibly busy, and it's marvelous to have you here. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Um, and we're going to have a fantastic panel with some real illuminati. Um, don't hold back. It's going to be question and answer sessions. Um, it will be recorded, of course. You know, there's no Chatham House fraud here. But <laughs> this is a great opportunity to really get under the skin and really talk about the research agenda because we're so passionate about that. That's what everyone in the room is about. Um, we're going to finally end with talking about something we really feel is going to be absolutely key, which is developing personal careers. Um, and in Gordon's memory, we want to talk to you a little bit about these Gordon McVie Global Fellowships and, and really launch something we went to do in 2023. Um, so we'll talk to you a little bit about that at, at the end. Um, Julie Tarod, and Claudia and Danny, um, and I think Sir Chris or Rajan as well will be talking about that. So that's fabulous. So without much ado, I'm going to hand over to Bill Edwards to tell us a little bit about the Gordon Museum. Over to you, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's back down. Nice to see you all in the museum. Um, you're going to have a very interesting afternoon. So this is the low point. Um, <laughs> I'm very aware I'm the sort of um, warm-up act, so feel free to relax. Um, Richard very kindly asked me to talk about the museum, because you're going to be here for the afternoon and probably not get to see much of the museum, but it, it, we thought it might be interesting just for you to know a little bit about us and what we do. Um, so this is just a part of a much longer and much more boring lecture, um, but I'll just shoot through it. 
Um, so it's just an introduction to the museum. This is the new museum at Guy's. This opened in 1905, the Gould Museum. Um, the previous museum, the Pathology Museum, was the other side of the green. Uh, that opened in 1826. And the curator in those days was Thomas Hodgkin. So as you see, standards have slipped somewhat, but <laughs> there I am. Um, Thomas Hodgkin wanted to start a pathology collection, so we're not a public museum because we still had specimens from living patients. We're open to the medical public, but we're here to teach medical professionals. So that's our own and from anywhere in the world, but not the general public. And the Hodgkin wanted to do something similar, but he also wanted to gather, so he wanted to start with new specimens, but he also wanted to gather the random specimens that lurked on the site. So I don't know if you know our history at all, but our main hospital was really, certainly pre merger with Kings anyway, main hospital was the Guys and St. Thomas's. The Guys is the new hospital that opened in 1725 as a hospital for the incurable. And St. Thomas's, which was a classical European hospital for the curable, which used to be right next door to us, that opened in 1190. So our history goes back quite a long way. So our oldest specimen at the moment, and it isn't me, Richard, because I'm much older, the oldest specimen at the moment is from 1601, 16, sorry, 1608. The present new specimen is a year old, but I'm actually literally waiting on a phone call from an operating theatre nearby, and I will go and collect something from a, a, a donor patient very soon. So we are adding all the time. We're here to educate. Um, Thomas Hodgkin's museum, the other side of the green, was a very busy working area. Much of what's in that picture there is, is here when the Gould Museum opened in 1905, uh, and we're an educative collection. Um, we're very lucky to have quite a lot of interesting artefacts from the 19th century, other than specimens. So we've got about 600 anatomical dermatology, pathology, comparative anatomy wax models, all made by Joseph Town of the living and the dead. Um, the pathology is quite impressive. Uh, so we're talking about, the, you know, in terms of the surgery pre-anesthetic, as with these paintings on the wall, these were operated on without anesthetic, and all but one went home alive. The good old days. Um, embryology, comparative anatomy, lots of dermatology models. So I'm stating the obvious, perhaps, these are clearly models of the dead. So there's a the very first patient with Addison's disease, but that is only in bronzing, congenital conditions, pathologies, whatever. But the dermatology models are models of the living. So we have quite a lot of those. So if you want to put those in time, these are Dickensian Londoners walking up and down the Borough High Street. So over Christmas, while you're watching the Christmas Carol or whatever, these are the people who are actually walking up and down with conditions which were fairly chronic. So this is pre-antibiotics. Uh, uh, sulfide drugs are being used, so there's some treatment, not very effectively, but they're alive. I mean, nearly said alive and well, not particularly well. <laughs> I'm looking for monkeypox. If anyone's, can we talk later? If anyone's looking. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, by the way, as you arrived, you know, I greet you and point you in the right direction. I am actually scanning the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to say, I'm quite disappointed. You all look remarkably healthy. <laughs> so, um, no good. Um, so that was the 19th century. Then we recently, during COVID, just to keep me busy, we added a new collection from the 20th century. From a, so the, the, the 19th century made by a man called Joseph Town. The 20th century collection is made by a lady called Alice Gretner. So they're more standard European moulages, but very interesting. And include things that Town never melt models like X-ray burns, radiation poison, things like that. So again, it, it was helpful for us to add that. And we even have an artist in residence making brand new ones. So you will see various things around the museum which are brand new. So we, we use old techniques to teach new medicine because that's what we're for. I have a few research, little research interest in medical history, medical art. I do a little bit of cold case work for police forces, a tiny bit. But mostly what we do is to teach medical professionals. I mentioned the tumour paintings. Next door, where you'll be having some refreshments later, is the very first x-ray machine at Guy's. Fantastic piece of kit. Slight problem, hardly worth mentioning, no shielding. <laughs> so these are the days when you would irradiate the patient, the operator, and everyone in a 20-foot field. The good old days, or Bart's, I think. Is, anyway, I did say. Um, the very first stethoscope ever in the UK there. Hodgkin brought the stethoscope over from uh, France, and brought that to us. I mentioned Hodgkin, we're also the home for Hodgkin, Addison Bright, Ashley Cooper, so their paintings, their ephemera, their specimens are here. We still refer to them, we still use them when we can. Uh, this Hodgkin, our, our museum father, grandfather, as it were, with the, all his specimens, but we're about teaching. And I mentioned the dates of the oldest and newest specimen. 
We're an elective and educative collection. We're trying to help people, medics, so undergraduate, postgraduate medics, dentists, nurses, physios, biomedical scientists, police forces, hybrid days, paramedics, uh, the military wings, armed forces. Our medical bubble is quite big. Every specimen has sheets and information. Uh, so this is a classic example of what happens if you use your bed springs. Um, you know, I'm boring, but I'm not that boring. Please don't eat your bed springs. You never die, you just wish you could. Um, I point out he passed that one there. Uh, that's rather impressive. Um, histology, we have lots of forensic specimens, so we don't just tell the story, we include all the information. You've got to take, we, curatorship is about entertaining and getting people's interest. You have to give them everything. You have to tell the story and have to reinterpret it. But things, if you have a specimen like this, this poor lady had a kyphosis and a scoliosis at the same time. For God's sake, have an x-ray, you know, try and, you know, explore the specimen. Um, we go to a lot of trouble with how we display things. They're not just shoved in a box. We might stain tissue, we might fill it with gelatin. Uh, so there's a heart, you can make a heart sound like a heart completely transparent and inject coloured dyes into the coronary arteries. So when we're teaching, instead of using a picture, get the students to hold a heart and they can see the coronary artery. Can't beat the real thing. So we're all about undergraduate teaching. So maybe small groups, big groups, on the galleries with specimens, with technology, I don't really mind. Um, in various ways, we do a lot of postgraduate teaching, a lot of it surgical. So the thing, the latest one was this one where you have devices in someone's spine that connect with a, a satellite by GPS so that the surgeons know exactly where the in instruments are. Now I'm a bit old fashioned, but the idea that that gadget there is getting signals from outer space just impresses me no end. But then I still think faxes are magic, so you know, there you go. <laughs> 